What's up, folks? Welcome, welcome, welcome. You're live with Mr. Black. Just doing a little uh, Thursday night chart analysis. For those of you joining us, just let us know if there's any tickers you want to look at, your current pairs, whatever it is, and I'll show you how a professional would break it down. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the follows, guys. We appreciate it. This is Paychex. Paychex. And they had their earnings yesterday. I mean, it's interesting because it did bounce right out of the demand zone, right? But as I told you guys, like, I've been treating demand zones a little bit cautiously just because of the whole market, right? The whole market being very sentimental right now. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Like, if it gets back up here to the 122.40, that would be an interesting option. All right, guys, what do you want to look at? AMD, let's go look at AMD. Let's hit it. AMD. All right, so when we're looking at the charts, guys, we always start from the same perspective, right? We want to start from a top-down analysis. And what I mean by that is we want to start in higher time frames and drill down to lower time frames. <laughs> you like my notes to myself? This zone sucks, don't trade it. <laughs> I like when I leave myself notes. I don't even remember why that note's there, but so it is. So it is. <laughs> um, why do we want to start from higher time frames? Because higher time frames tend to control lower time frames, right? So we never want to be uh, like not aware of what's happening on the higher time frames. So here we are on the monthlies, and what I'm looking for initially, guys, is I'm looking for areas of institutional order flow. Institutional order flow means areas where banks, hedge funds, financial institutions, basically where major players are buying and selling. And the reason that interests us, and this is the way most professional traders trade, right? The reason we're interested in that is because banks and institutions place such large orders that they create major imbalances in order flow. And at the end of the day, all price action is in, in, pardon me, all price action is an indication of an imbalance in order flow, right? If we have rallies, that means there are more buyers and sellers, right? If we have drops, that means there are more sellers and buyers. So we're looking for these imbalances driven by banks and institutions because they place such large orders that they naturally cause these major imbalances. So right here, I have this beautiful impulse, balance, impulse, area of institutional buying right here. Can everyone see that? What's up, Andrew? How you doing, brother? Nice imbalance in order flow. Some big banker institution, obviously we don't know who, guys, right? But some big banker institution bought and bought heavily right here, driving price action upwards explosively. Why do I know that's a banker institution, guys? Why is that not you or me placing trade? Because think about the level of capital that's required to create that, that big in imbalance that quickly. Does that make sense? It requires a tremendous amount of capital to create that large in imbalance that abruptly. That's not something you or I are capable of doing. So barring some major fundamental announcement, that's gonna be an institutional order, right? So I have institutional buying, I have institutional selling. We can see that price here, drop, base drop, Nice imbalance of orders, pushing price action downwards. Some big bank institutions sold and sold heavily here. Now, the reason this interests us, finding where the banks have bought and have sold, is because banks place such large orders that it normally takes them months, sometimes years, to actually fill their full orders, right? Because they're not trying to buy 100 shares or 1,000 shares. They're trying to buy millions of shares, millions of contracts, millions of standard lots, huge, huge positions. And the markets, like anything economic, require balance for every buyer, there must be a seller. For every seller, there must be a buyer. So if you're a big banker institution, the biggest challenge you have is actually filling your orders because you're placing such large orders that usually there isn't availability to fill your full order in one fell swoop, right? So like imagine if I'm State Street and I'm trying to short sell AMD up here at this limit price of 116.75, right? Because banks place limit orders. They don't want to chase market price. So they set this limit order and they want to short sell, whatever, 4 million shares or probably more than that, whatever, because AMD, you know, whatever, whatever, 5 million shares. It doesn't matter. 5 million shares of AMD at this limit price of 116.75. Just because they want to short sell 5 million shares at that specific limit price, does that mean there are going to be 5 million buyers just sitting there waiting conveniently for them to place that order? No, that's incredibly unlikely, right? So what happens to banks and institutions is they put these large orders in and they only fill a little bit at a time. So they might want to sell, short sell 5 million, but maybe there's 2 million buyers available. So what do they do? Well, they take out all 2 million buyers. Every, all of those 2 million buyers, they say, these are all mine, 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 right? And they fill those orders. 
And what are they left with? Well, they've just created a huge imbalance in order flow. Suddenly they've eliminated every single buyer available at a price point. And now they have this huge stack of unfilled sell orders, those 3 million unfilled orders or UFOs as they're called, sitting there at that price level. And if there's an imbalance in order flow, if there are more sellers and buyers, price is gonna go down, right? The market's like anything in the world moved by the law of supply and demand. If there are more buyers and sellers, price goes up. If there are more sellers and buyers, price goes down. If there are equal numbers of buyers and sellers, price consolidates and moves sideways. Does that make sense to everybody? So here we have major institutional selling. Did they fill their full order? Well, no, they couldn't have possibly filled their full order. If they had filled their full order, price would not have moved away. The very fact that we have explosive price action downwards tells us that there is an imbalance in order flow at this level, in this case, more sellers and buyers, right? And why is that of interest? Because that means there's a high probability of unfilled orders sitting here at this level. So when price comes back in for the first time, this was what? February, 2022, guys. Look at how long it took for this price to get back to this level. All the way back here to July, June, July of 20, no, pardon me, June, May, June of 2023. That's how long it took to get back to that level, right? But when it came back in, what did it do? Well, it hit that huge stack of sell orders, all those unfilled orders left over. And once again, if there's more sellers and buyers, what happens to price, guys? Came back down. Does that make sense to everybody? That's exactly what we're looking for. Rather than chasing the initial move caused by the banks, like most retail traders do, right? Most retail traders chase price action. Instead of chasing the price that's caused by the banks, we're gonna identify where they sell, we're gonna identify where they buy, and then we're gonna have the patience to wait for price to get back to these levels so we can take advantage and trade together with the bank's institutions because they have all those unfilled orders sitting at that level. Is everybody with me? Give me a yes in the chat if that makes sense to you. What's up, Mr. X, how you doing, man? Good, good, good. Thank you for the likes, thank you for the follow, guys. We really do appreciate it. It actually does help boost us with the algorithms for TikTok and Instagram. So if you don't mind tapping the screen for us, we really appreciate it. So major imbalance in order flow, the supply zone has already been hit, came back in, hit those unfilled orders, popped right back out. On the demand side, rally, base, rally, area of institutional buying, apparently we've already hit here as well. Let's go look at this down on a lower time frame, right? Because we're gonna look at multiple time frames anytime we're doing analysis, guys. So now I'm down to my weeklies. Here I have two things that I wanna look for. I wanna look for my trend, and I wanna look if, to see if there's any correlating zone structure, right? So first things first, I've not looked at Amazon, my man. Uh, we can look at Bitcoin. What is my trend here on AMD? Is this an uptrend, a downtrend, or a sideways moving trend? And I'm gonna drop to a line view so you guys can visualize it more easily. We live trade with our members, cool dad. Uh, we don't do it on TikTok because that would be illegal, right? That would be an earnings representation. But if you're a member, then we, trade, we live trade in front of you. Yeah, clear, clear uptrend, right? And this is a confusing thing. Limo, what you're saying is understandable. You're probably looking at this part and you're thinking, what do you mean? It's a downtrend, lower highs, lower lows. The reason this is not a downtrend is because we have not broken past our controlling higher low on the uptrend, right? And an uptrend is simply higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, right? So here I add higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs, higher lows, higher highs. As of this moment right now, this is still a higher low. Does that make sense? Until I've broken past this level, I am simply in the retracement from my impulsive move on this high, on this uptrend. Does that make sense to everyone? Not paper trade, it's proof in the pudding. Yeah, we trade live with our money, man. We trade live, we provide you with trades that we are taking in the market, we do everything. We do it in front of you. We even prove, give a money back guarantee based off of the trades we provide. Like I cannot promise you profit or success, my man, but we're very confident putting our money where our mouth is as far as what we do. So, Still an uptrend, what does that mean for us as retail traders? That means ideally we would like to go long. We would rather trade with trend than against trend. So now I have to go back to my candle view and I'm gonna look for the same things, guys. I'm looking for institutional order flow. I'm looking for areas where banks and institutions are buying and selling because I don't wanna fight the banks. I wanna trade together with them. They control the markets, right? No matter how you cut it, it requires a huge amount of capital to actually affect change, price action in the markets. And unless you're a secret billionaire or trillionaire, you're not causing that level of change. So I'm not gonna try and pretend, pretend I can see the future. I'm gonna simply see where the major bank institutions are trading and trade together with them. Nobody controls the market. 
Um, well, it comes down to money, man. If you or I were to buy, let, like, let's, let me put it in this a simple way. Let's say you or I were to buy 100 shares of AMD. Would that move the price of AMD? What do you think, crypto? Would, if you or I were to buy 100 shares, would that move the price of AMD? Hopefully soon. At some point. No, absolutely not. I'm just going to take you as if you were answering for crypto, Junior. No, of course it wouldn't. It requires much deeper pockets, right? However, if Goldman Sachs were to buy 10 million shares of, of AMD, would that move the price of crypto? Would that, <laughs> would, that move crypto? would that move the price of AMD? Of course it would, right? Because that would create a huge imbalance in order flow. At the end of the day, what is price action? What are we actually seeing on the charts? When you see big green candles like that, what does that represent? That represents an imbalance in order flow right? More buyers and sellers. All price action is a representation of an imbalance in order flow. And it requires a huge amount of capital to create major imbalances in order flow. Does that make sense? Well, somebody who worked an investment firm, I can tell you that's definitely not true, man. But you can have opinions. Opinions are fine. But if you're saying money doesn't move the markets, you're very mistaken. Money absolutely moves the markets. If a bank takes a very large position, you can't, you can't ignore economics. Economics are economics. That's not an opinion, right? The markets, like anything economic, require balance. For every buyer, there must be a seller. For every seller, there must be a buyer. That's period. That's not an opinion. That's just fact, right? So if you have more buyers than sellers, in other words, more demand than supply, that drives price action upwards, period. No exception to that rule. If you have more sellers than buyers, more supply than demand, that drives price action downwards, period. No exception to that rule. That is what price action is. When you see price movement in the market, it is an indication of an imbalance in order flow. Does that make sense? Now, the reason we're interested in finding areas where major banks and institutions are buying and selling is because they place such large orders that they naturally create imbalances in order flow. Are you with me? So uh, I, I don't know if you're wanting to quibble on like semantics, man. I'm saying if you want me to put it in different words, banks can place large enough orders that they can drive price action. Does that satisfy you to a better extent rather than saying control the markets? They can actually cause price action because they have enough money to do so. Are you with me on that? If you prefer the, to use that term instead of control. Maybe that'll be a more satisfying term for you. Anyway, so do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the weeklies? Yeah, I mean, I understand that you guys have that opinion. That's okay. I differ in a bit, but I guess you can say not generically across the board in every single situation. I agree with that. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the reality of it, right, man? I'm trying to treat people as if they're trying to genuinely ask questions and not just be dicks. So I'm hoping you guys are just genuinely asking. Do you think she'll hit an order block then grab BSL? I don't know. Let's go Let's go do an our analysis here, man. So do I have any clear institutional order flow here on AMD? I have this pivot reversal right here, but as many of you remember, because I've talked about it for the last few days, the reason we're not drawing in this pivot reversal, it's a fallacy many SMC people believe and. I, I don't know, man. I'm not an SMC person. I worked at the third largest investment firm in the world as a trader. I have personally placed trades that have affected change in the market. So I'm, I'm not, like, this isn't an opinion on my part. I've done it firsthand working at an investment firm. This is what I did for a living professionally. Does that make sense? Do you think today's rally will continue tomorrow? That I cannot tell you, Luis. That would be predicting the future. And unfortunately, I do not have that ability. Would you recommend beginning on Weeble? I'm not a big fan of indirect access brokers, Medi. Um, you got to think like, what is Weeble's business model? They sell order flow, right? Which means you're getting filled at worst prices. You just don't know what price you're paying. So I would prefer you have a direct access broker and you actually know the price you're paying for an asset. And then, you know, even though, yes, oh, I have to pay commission. Cool. I'd rather know what I'm paying and know that I'm getting filled at the price I want to be filled at. Does that make sense? So that's just a difference of opinions. That's why I recommend using only direct access brokers. I would never use an indirect access broker. Um, direct and indirect means like this. Uh, they have to sell their order flow to a third party provider to actually execute the orders on your behalf. Can EA be profitable? What do you mean? 
What chart is this? This is AMD. So let's finish what we're doing here. All right, so here we have institutional order flow, but I'm not gonna use this area of pivot reversal right here because this wick has to come down to this previous level of imbalance to actually gain the strength to go up, right? So even though there is structure here, right? This is a demand zone. We're not gonna use this demand zone because of this giant wick coming down here to gain momentum from down here. Does that make sense, everybody? The actual imbalance in order flow is not up here, it's down here. Everybody with me on that? And this is why we say, guys, like, Sometimes people get hung up on mechanics and they want trading to be as simple as if I just learned the mechanics, then I'm good, right? And unfortunately, that's just not the reality of it. Trading takes time and effort to learn and there's no replacement for actual practice and a hands-on experience, right? Trading is experiential. It's important to learn structure. It's important to learn coursework and all that stuff. But the way I put it to people so that they understand, it's like, it's like learning how to play a musical instrument or speak a foreign language, right? If you go and you watch me play guitar for eight hours straight, you just watch me play guitar, does that mean you know how to play guitar? Absolutely not. You still have to actually physically pick up the guitar and practice yourself. There's no shortcut to that, right? And that's why I always try and tell people like, it is important to learn the mechanics, but please don't misinterpret and think that if I know the mechanics, I now know, I now know how to trade. The same way you can watch a video on YouTube about improving your jump shot, and you can learn all the mechanics of a good jump shot, of keeping your elbow in, keeping your arm straight, following through. That doesn't mean you now shoot 80% from the free throw line, right? You still have to actually go up to the free throw line and throw the ball and practice to actually learn how to do it. Does that make sense to everyone? I'll do whatever I want, dot. That's kind of the way these things work. I do what I want to do, not really what other people want to do, right? So anyway. So this is the actual level of imbalance. Um, do I have any clear institutional order flow on the supply side? I do. I have this impulse balance, impulse reversal right here. You can see that's institutional selling, pushing price action down, right? But for us, ideally, we would like to go long rather than short. Uh, I don't really recommend paper trading many. I, I find it to be a waste of time, honestly. I would rather you trade with very tiny amounts of capital than um, paper trade. Yeah, I understand, man. But you understand it's not just about you. It's about everybody. If people ask me questions, I'm going to answer them and I will do them as I wish to do. Does that make sense? So institutional buying, institutional selling. Let's drill down to the dailies. And this is where we're going to look for an actionable trade opportunity on the dailies, right? And boy, did it bounce right off that little demand level, huh? Now, I will tell you guys, I told you this before in the chat. I would not trade this demand zone until we had that confirmation right there, right? All demand zones right now, I'm only treating as confirmations, guys. You remember me saying this? The reason being, even though we're coming down, we're hitting a lot of demand zones right now, overall market sentiment is still bearish. So I wanna have a confirmation of imbalances still left there before I take a position, right? So this trade, I would only have taken after that daily candle right there closed. It bounced off the level beautifully. Like what more can you ask for, right? Here was the impulse, balance, impulse, imbalance and order flow. Price came back down, hit the unfilled orders, popped back up. And then it came back down a second time, hit the unfilled orders, popped back up. And what else do we have at this level, guys? We have daily weekly correlation. But at times I feel I may represent the 80 who are assigned. They may just want results. Yeah, it's okay. Again, man, I'm, I'm not concerned with individual people and what they care about. This is literally how I want to do things in whatever manner I want to do things, right? If I want to go talk about trading for the next hour, I will. If I want to go chart analysis for the next hour, I will. I'm going to do whatever I wish to do, not necessarily dictate be dictated by what people in the chat want. Make sense? Because I am doing this for free, right? This is knowledge. This is education. Some people will sit around and learn, some people won't. I'm not really bothered either way. <laughs> it doesn't really affect my life one way or the other if they wanna stick around or not. All right, anyway. So this has already been hit beautifully, right? You can see that was the original imbalance. And I know it's hard sometimes to understand the patterns, guys, when you're new. That's just the reality of it. Yeah, we can look at IWMN. We have a, we have a few that we wanna look at. Um, but just understand, it just takes time. That's the reality of it. So we are on the same page, you got good stuff. Okay, um, so imbalance and order flow, that was the initial imbalance. And where we prefer to trade, guys, as always, is the first hit, right? That was the first time we came back in because what are we ultimately looking for? I'm looking for areas where banks and institutions are buying and selling to see if I have an opportunity to buy and sell together with them. That's the whole concept behind how we trade here at Phantoms. 
And it's really the way most professionals trade, right? Because if you've ever worked at an investment firm, you've seen the price action caused by banks and institutions. Now, when you leave those investment firms, suddenly you don't have control of hundreds of millions or tens of millions or millions of dollars. You have control of your own money. And unless you're really, really wealthy, you're not causing price action in the markets, right? So when we leave, what we have to do is say, okay, I don't have that money anymore. So all I have to do is identify where the major players are buying and then buy with them, right? So I'm not going to chase the initial move caused by them. The initial amounts, this is a rally based rally right here, imbalance and order flow, price action moving up, right? Some big bank institution bought here, driving price action upwards explosively. Why did it come back down, by the way, guys? This is a very common occurrence you'll see sometimes when price first leaves out of zone structure, it almost immediately comes back down, retests, and then it shoots off. Why did it turn right here? What caused that turn? Who can tell me in the chat? Why did price reverse right there? No, man, I never placed market orders because my specific position was intermediate to long-term positioning for pharma and tech. So I never had occasion to place market orders, um, but I did not day trade for the company. So I imagine the people who day traded for the company would definitely place market orders from time to time, but in my position, never once. Yeah, yeah, if we look to the left here, what do I have over here? I have this rally base drop. Does everyone see that? That is an area of institutional selling right there. That's an imbalance in order flow where there are more sellers and buyers. So if I draw this little level right here, let me just draw around it for you guys so you can see it. And I'll take off the extension. Don't we, we don't need to extend it, there we go. That was what happened. It came back in and hit those unfilled sell orders. We'll mark that red for selling, right? It hit those unfilled sell orders and that's what caused price to get pushed back down. Does that make sense to everyone? Price action in the markets is rarely randomized. Most price action is very structured if you understand how to look at the markets and understand institutional order flow. You do have to learn how to read charts but you can see how this is not randomized. That was where the amounts was created. Some banker institutions sold here, pushing price action down, leaving that banker institution with unfilled orders sitting at this level, right? So when price came back in, it hit this demand zone, some institution bought here, pushing price action up. When price came back in and hit those unfilled orders for the first time, well, if there's more sellers and buyers, price gets pushed back down. And then it got pushed right back down to this demand zone. This demand zone's a little off, there we go push back down to this demand zone, it hit the unfilled buy orders left over from this move right here. And this time it broke right through, right? This zone was good for one hit and then there was not enough of an imbalance to hold the second time. And that is very common with standalone dailies, right guys? Standalone dailies tend to be weaker in structure. Usually they're good for one hits, maybe two, not a lot often beyond that. How often do you trade live for your students to learn? Uh, well, so in pro membership, we trade two two-hour live trading sessions every week, man. Yeah, trading is very, very mechanical, correct? It's very process-oriented. Your call, Mr. Black. Yes, I am. That's me, my man. So that's what caused that initial push, came back in, hit those unfilled buy orders, and this time, there weren't enough unfilled orders left here to hold those buyers in place. Broke right through. I went to BC, man. So there's the imbalance. Institutional buying came out, tested it once, popped back out. Because market sentiment was bearish, we only were willing to take this as a confirmation trade. So a confirmation trade means price comes in and then I wanna see it reverse and come back out and candle close. It can't just wick out, I need it to candle close like it did right here, right on this candle. And that's where we would be evaluating trade opportunity. Does that make sense? From that point forward is where we would say, now I'm gonna evaluate whether I wanna go long or not. Everybody with me on that? Good, good, good. Yeah, so this was a trade. I mean, we looked at this together and it's kind of cool to see how it works out, right guys? Because we did this way before the zone was hit. Because every, for anybody who's been watching me for more than one, two, three, four, five, six days, you saw us do this analysis. So it came down and hit, boom, right back up. And if you had taken this trade, you would have already locked in at least the one to one, hopefully the two to one, probably the three to one, right? That's what's cool about institutional order flow. At the end of the day, money moves the markets. If you have enough capital, you can affect price action in the markets. That's why we're just following the big boys. I'm not trying to predict where a bank's gonna buy. I'm not trying to predict where they're gonna sell. I'm not trying to see into the future. I'm seeing where they have bought and where they have sold. And then I'm having the patience to wait for price to get back to these levels to then see if we have an opportunity to buy and sell together with the banks or institutions. Does that make sense, everybody? Good, good, good. 
Excellent. All right, so this zone right here, I did not like the structure of, and I said, I marked it right here. That's why I'm not, I would not trade this short from the supply zone, right? Either way, market is overall bullish. If I was in this trade still at this point, I would be looking to try and go to that far target. I don't know if it will. I don't mind if it will just bounce right back down because even though I would never trade the supply zone, um, doesn't mean it won't hold, right guys? Just because I wouldn't trade it doesn't mean it's not gonna work out. But for me, I don't like the structure of this. I don't like the fact that it's already been retested. Everything about it is bad for me. So that's why we marked it as bad. And you can even see here, guys, it's super cool when you start understanding institutional order flow. Look at how price moved here. What's happening here, right? Here's an area of inmounts, a rally based drop, right? Not only a drop, but that is a pro gap reversal indicating a large inmounts in order flow. Shoots out of this area of institutional selling, right? More sellers than buyers. Yeah, thank you for the likes and the follows, guys. We appreciate it. It really does help boost us with the algorithms. Um, this is what I think about trend lines, man. They're okay uh, as just something like a confirmation, but the reality of it is most of the time when trend lines work out, they work out because of institutional order flow, not because of the trend lines. Does that make sense? So there's nothing wrong with having a guide and looking at it, but the only time I would be concerned about it is if it's actually coinciding with institutional order flow. That's when it interests me. So I rarely draw trend lines nowadays. I used to all religiously draw them all in on all my charts back in the day. And nowadays, the only time I'll ever draw them in is if we have like a consolidating market, something like, you know, a pennant or a wedge, at which point then I might be interested in seeing the breakout from that area. But I'm not gonna trade off of the line just because of the bounce from the top to the bottom, because usually the bounce is not about the line, it's about order flow. It's about institutional buy and, you know, buy and selling, right? Best advice for a complete beginner? Um, I mean, if you want to learn more about trading, man, we do a workshop on Wednesdays and we'll teach you more about how professionals actually trade and analyze in the market. If you want to register, it's free. Just go to our website uh, right here, tradephantoms.com. The next one's going to be next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. And you can just register for free by clicking the purple register here button. We'll teach you more about it. All right. So anyway, institutional buying, institutional selling, but this is kind of cool because you see this inmounts and order flow, right? Pro gap reversal indication, large inmounts, comes down here and suddenly it pops back up. Why did it pop back up, guys? Because of this demand zone right here, rally, base rally. That was institutional buying. So it hit those unfilled buy orders and then that gained enough momentum to push rice right back up to supply. And then it hit those unfilled sell orders and that's where we would want to trade, right? We like first hits. And so kind of popped right back now because if there's more sellers and buyers, price goes down. Does that make sense? Some comments were filtered to protect the community's experience. Oh my goodness. Take it easy, man. Um, and then it pushed back down again and then it popped back up a second time. Why did it pop back up a second time? Because we have another demand zone here. Rally base rally. Hit those unfilled buy orders again and turn back up. Do you guys see how it's not random? Does everyone see how price action is very structured if you actually understand how the markets work? I don't normally draw all the zones in for you guys because it's just kind of, it becomes a little overwhelming to see all this stuff on the charts. But it's cool when you understand what's driving the price movement, right? Most price action is price bouncing back and forth between institutional buying and institutional selling, and then institutional buying, and then institutional selling, and then institutional buying, and then institutional selling, and so on and so forth, and back and forth, and back and forth, until eventually all orders are filled. And once there aren't any more unfilled orders sitting at a level, or there isn't enough of an imbalance to hold structure, that's when zones get broken. Is everybody with me on that? Does that make sense? When most people start understanding how the markets actually work, it makes a lot of sense because you're like, oh, of course, if somebody's buying a huge amount of something that is going to drive price one way or another, right? And that's exactly what we're looking for. So for those of you who took this demand zone trade, good for you. Do not trade this. At, well, you can do whatever you want. I would not trade the supply zone, right? I'm not going to go and take that. Uh, what state am I in? I'm in Massachusetts, my man. Level two sell and buy relative flow. I'd have to calculate to know. Yeah, level two data is fine, man. It's just grouping together limit orders. It's it's nothing that's significant to me. Does that make sense? I, again, all that stuff, guys, is just confirmation. Fine for confirmation. I'm not gonna make my trading decisions off level two data. Can you speak of reversal and weaknesses in Wix? Uh, that's not really how I trade, man. Can you look at Neo, please? Sure, we can look at Neo. You trade forex? Awesome, man. I trade forex every day. Bitcoin was the next one, right? Let's go look at Bitcoin, brother. 
I'm sure for those of you who took that trade, you love me, right? You're probably like, Mr. Black's pretty cool. Yeah, it's nice to see price finally breaking out of these structures, man. Uh, all right, so here we are in the world of Bitcoin. Um, here's my deal with Bitcoin. I'm not trading it right now from where it is, and I'll explain why. Let's start from a higher time frame. Let's start, as always, guys, let's drill down from the top to the bottom, right? We're going to look from the higher time frames. Why? Because higher time frames tend to control lower time frames. I don't care if you're a scalper, day trader, swing trader, whatever it is you do, I strongly encourage you to start at higher time frames. It will help you tremendously in your lower time frame trading, right? The website is just tradephantoms.com, man. That's, that's the website right there. You just click the purple register here button to register, all right? Um, so institutional buying. Do I have any clear institutional buying here on Bitcoin? I do have this beautiful impulse, balance, impulse right here, right? What's actually happening here in terms of price action? Think about what these candles represent in terms of what's happening in the market. Buyers were in control, right? Everyone can see that. Very clear impulsive rallying right here, right? So buyers are in control. Suddenly, they meet this wall of sell orders and it creates this period of balance where both buyers are buying and sellers are selling and price is in equilibrium because what is a small body candle? That just means both buyers and sellers are comfortable with price. Price is not moving significantly, right? So it creates this period of balance where buyers are buying, sellers are selling, and price just moves sideways for a little bit, creating a period of balance, a basing area. But eventually, there were so many more buyers than sellers, so many more buyers and sellers that every single seller was eliminated, and all we had left was this huge pile of buy orders, right? And if I have an imbalance in orders, if I have way more buyers than sellers, guys, right? Big imbalance, what's gonna happen to price? It's gonna shoot up. And that's exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for these imbalances driven by banks and institutions because they place such large orders that it causes major imbalances as an order flow. Everybody with me on that? Because they're not buying 100 shares. They're not buying 1,000 shares. They're buying large positions, millions of shares, millions of contracts, millions of lots. So big, big positions that drive significant imbalances as an order flow. What got you into trading? I don't know, Louise. I was trying to think about that the other day. I mean, I started very young. I interned at 18 years old at an investment firm. Um, and I think it was just because my dad was kind of learning about trading as well. And then I got interested in it. And then I ended up interning there. And then since then, it was just from that point forward. That's all I did, right? That's awesome, Luke. I'm glad to hear it, my man. Yeah, it's super cool to hear you guys uh, doing well with all the with the analysis here. And I mean, I, I do emphasize, of course, this is not the end all be all guys, right? This is just step one of what we do for analysis. But it's really nice that you guys send me a lot of messages and stuff of trades that worked out. And that's awesome. So I'm glad to hear you guys learning more about how the markets work and seeing success with it. So that's great. So institutional buying right here, driving price action upwards. On the sell side, do I have any clear institutional order flow? Well, up here at the top, I have this beautiful impulse, balance, impulse, area of institutional selling. Nice imbalance, huh? Nice imbalance in order flow. Major selling right there. Look at that explosive price action. So institutional buying, institutional selling. Let's drill down to the weeklies. Awesome cavity. I look forward to it, man. Just let me know when you're ready to go. Uh, we don't partner with any brokers, Limo, although we are going to start doing... Uh, What's it called? An affiliate with Awanda probably because that is who we use for our Forex trading. I personally don't trade a lot of futures, Luca. Like I rarely trade futures. Of the phantoms, the one who trades futures the most would be Mr. Blue. Beginner here, so I have a silly questions. Download a MetaTrader for my phone. What for my laptop? You can download MetaTrader for your laptop too, man. MT4 works on laptops, works on phones. I used MetaTrader for many, many years. I don't use it anymore, but I used to use it. Anyway, so here I am on the weeklies, and I'm looking for two things on my intermediate time frame, guys. I'm looking for trend, and I'm looking for correlation. So first things first, I'm going to drop down to a line view because it facilitates visualization. What is my trend here on Bitcoin? Is this an uptrend, a downtrend, or a sideways moving trend? You guys tell me in the chat. Up, down, or sideways right here? I'll put this cursor right here just to facilitate visualization. What do you guys think? Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the follows, guys. We do appreciate it. Um, it's an interesting one, right? So technically, 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 it's actually broken past this controlling higher low 
of that uptrend, right? Can everyone see this right here? Let me just make sure this worked on a candle too, because we do that's so close that we do have to make sure a candle actually closed past it. And you can see that candle just barely closed past. Can everyone see that? So it did technically break structure. So it ended that uptrend as soon as we candle closed past that controlling higher low, because you can't have an uptrend with a lower low. That breaks the definition of what an uptrend is, right? So from that point forward, what you gotta do is you gotta say, okay, uptrend's dead. What was my controlling higher high on my uptrend? Well, my controlling higher high on my uptrend was right here. That was my controlling higher high, right? That was my impulse and move for my corrective. So impulse, correction, impulse. So that's my controlling higher high. So now you say from this point forward, what has happened in terms of order flow? And you can see I have kind of an impulsive move, a correction, and an impulsive move. And that is a downtrend. I know it's hard to see that way, but it is technically a downtrend because of that little correction right there. If it wasn't for that correction, this wouldn't be a downtrend if this was just one impulsive move. But it is technically a downtrend right now, right? So what does that mean for us as traders? Well, it means ideally we would like to go short. My problem is here, if I look on the weeklies, I have order flow up here, drop base drop, nice area of institutional selling, and I have institutional buying right here, drop base rally, institutional buying, right? And we can see that these levels have been bounced out several times. But when I drill down to my dailies, my supply zone has already been hit more than once, right? That was where the initial imbalance was created, rally base drop. We actually traded long from here up. We didn't trade this short, causing this imbalance in order for pushing price back down because this had not been broken. It was still an uptrend originally when we took this trade, right? But so since then, we have not traded Bitcoin, but you can see it came back down into this demand zone. It's really spent a lot of time in here, but there's still enough of an imbalance down here at this lower multiple time frame correlation that price pushed back up and pushed it all the way to supply. And if we were to trade short, I did not take this trade, guys. I took this trade. I didn't take this trade. That would have been the point where we would have wanted to get in. Does that make sense? We wait for price to retrace back to these levels to see if we have an opportunity to buy and sell together with the bank's institutions. So came back in, hit those unfilled orders and popped right back down to demand. And then it hit those unfilled buy orders and popped right back up to supply. And then hit those unfilled sellers and so far has popped back out. Does that make sense to everybody? Uh, if you could tell anything to your 18 year old self who wants to be a trader, what would you say? I would say understand institutional order flow and price action analysis first. That would be the first thing I would recommend to anybody wanting to trade. Like forget about support and resistance and candlestick patterns and Bollinger Bands and LA waves and moving average stochastics and RSI and fib retracements and volume and VWAP and MACDs and all. All that stuff's fine, guys, but none of it works consistently. So I would say don't focus on that initially. Focus initially on institutional order flow and price action analysis because that is what actually drives price action in the markets for the most part. And then you can learn that other stuff if you want to. I've been trading for 26 years, my man. Be better to buy on the first jump at top. You're saying if it retraces all the way back up here to this supply zone up here, if it gets back up here to where we have multiple time frame correlation, it's not the first hit, man. The imbalance was created here and it's already come out and come back in and hit it. That was the first hit. Does that make sense? That was actually the first hit. So the first hit's already made. If it comes back up a second time, that would be the second hit. How do you plot on institutional order flows? Well, we're doing it together, my man. Not fully automated, V. Anytime we've ever had algorithms at the companies I worked at, there was always a human overseer because I've yet to see an algorithm that works in all market conditions. Um, so at least in my experience, I cannot speak ubiquitously for every investment firm in the world, but I know a lot of professional traders and I don't know of any investment firms that just let an algo run free. Usually what they have is we'll have different algos for different market conditions and there will be a human overseer that will set essentially the boundaries around how the algo can trade. Does that make sense? And then they'll execute if the market conditions are correct, they'll execute within those conditions until those parameters are broken, at which point they turn off the algo. Because the main advantage of an algo is that it can execute at a much ha faster uh, rate than a human being can, right? So that's why banks and institutions like it. It's they, I can't click the button millions of times per second, but a computer can. Sure, man, you can, you can show it to us. Can you do Mara, please? Sure, we can look at Mara. Let's go look at Mara, Greg. Anyway, whole point of this is, I'm not gonna trade this demand zone anymore. It's so beat up at this point, right? Look at how many times we've hit this lower zone. One, two, three, four, right? 
on the upper zone, we've hit it so many times as well. I'm not trading this demand zone anymore. The supply zone has been hit once, twice. I'm not trading that anymore. So I need price to break through these structures to give me new potential trade opportunities, right? So if I can get back up here or pass down here to the demand, then I'm gonna see if there's an opportunity for myself, right? But right now, I'm done with Bitcoin. I'm sitting on my hands with Bitcoin until we break through these levels because I can't keep trading these zones that have already been hit multiple times, right? All right, cool. So let's go on to something else. Do you wanna look at Mara? Let's go look at Mara. Thank you for the likes and the follows, guys. We really do appreciate it. It actually does really help us with the algorithms when you guys tap the screen. So we really, really appreciate that. It helps boost us to other people's free pages. Thank you for the gift, Eska. Appreciate that. All right, so here we are in Mara. Oh, I'm not doing all this with you guys. That's more advanced stuff. We're not gonna do that on TikTok and Instagram. That's gonna confuse your lives. All right, so here we are in Mara. Let's start from scratch, guys. Let's do it from zero. Let's go from zero and do it all together, right? Let's do the whole analysis together. We can start from scratch. So, yeah, oftentimes, Kevin, I usually will trade first hit, maybe second hit in very specific occasions, very rarely anything beyond that, right? Yeah, we trade all asset classes, Roberto. We can look at gold. All right, so here we are in the monthlies. And what I'm looking for is, again, I'm looking for areas of institutional order flow. I'm about to explain that right now, Django. What do I mean by institutional order flow? We're looking for areas where banks and institutions are buying and selling, right? We don't react to price movement. We don't react to things that have already happened and chase price. Rather than trade the way most retail traders trade, right, which is chasing price, what professional traders do is we identify where major banks and institutions are buying and where they're selling, and then we have the patience to wait for price to get back to these levels to see if we have an opportunity to buy with the banks and sell with the banks. Does that make sense, everybody? I don't want to chase price that's caused by the banks buying and selling. I want to see where they buy and sell and then buy and sell with them. Different concept in terms of how to trade, right? So here I am on the monthlies. Do I have any, oops, don't want that. Do I have any clear institution order flow here on Mara? I do, I have this beautiful impulse, balance, impulse right here, area of institutional buying right here, right? And you can see guys, because I know somebody asked me, is, is it the same as support and resistance? You can see very clearly how it is not the same as support and resistance, right? Supply and demand rarely coincides with support and resistance. Sometimes it does, most of the time it doesn't, right? Because who trades around support and resistance, guys? Who likes to trade around those sweet, sweet support and resistance levels? Retail traders do, right? And if banks know where you're trading, one of the, if there's one big thing that you need to understand about the financial markets, it's that banks and institutions are not passively trading alongside you. They are actively trading against you because retail traders are responsible for the majority of profits that banks, hedge funds, financial institutions make in the financial markets, right? So you are not the casual passerby, you are the target. So it's very, very important to understand how professionals trade because if you're gonna trade the way most retail traders trade, you are gonna be in the crosshairs of the bank's institutions and they have enough capital to push price through levels where you trade. This is why so many people, when they first start trading, most retail traders trade the same way, right? They're very reactionary to market movement. If retail traders see the market going up, 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 what do they do, guys? They buy, 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 right? They're like, oh my God, this could go to the moon. If they see it going down, 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 what do they do? Oh, sell, 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 panic, 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 right? They're always reacting to things that are already occurring. But if something's already occurring and then you're going and making a decision, what are you really doing? You're chasing price movement. And you're basically hoping that price will continue moving in that direction. That is very counter to how professionals trade. Professionals do not chase price movement. We identify areas where we wanna buy and where we wanna sell, and we wait for price to come to us. Does that make sense, everybody? Don't chase price, identify areas where you wanna buy and sell and wait for price to come to those levels so you can buy and sell together with the major players. I do not wanna fight the banks. I certainly don't wanna fall into their trap of chasing the price movement. I wanna see where they're buying and selling so I can trade together with them, right? So do I have any clear institutional order flow? Well, I have this horrible, ugly zone structure right here. That is zone structure though, right? I can't ignore it just because it's ugly. Gigantic, horrible wick. That is institutional selling. You can see that price came out, came back in once, 
hit those unfilled orders, popped out, came back in twice, hit those unfilled orders, popped out, came back in a third time, hit those unfilled orders, popped out. So boy, is this zone beat up. Does everyone see how many times this zone has been hit since the initial imbalance was created? That was the initial imbalance with a pro gap reversal, more sellers and buyers pushing price action down, came back in, hit those unfilled sellers for the first time, and if there's more sellers and buyers, hit all those UFOs, guys, boom, slam back down. Came back in a second time, and there's still an imbalance, so it still popped back out. Came back in that third time, still an imbalance, but this time we penetrated really deeply and came back out, right? Everybody with me on that? This is not random, this is institutional order flow. That's where major bank institutions sold and just kept hitting and filling more of those unfilled orders and more of those unfilled orders and more of those unfilled orders, right? I have not looked at SPY, man. Thank you, my man, appreciate the likes, bandos. Yeah, we can look at everything, guys. I'm, I'm pretty chill, man. I'm not, I'm not, I'm in no rush tonight, guys. So there we are on the monthlies. We have institutional buying, institutional selling. Would I trade the supplies on anymore, guys? No, I'm not gonna trade the supplies anymore. It's super beat up, right? Um, there's a beautiful supply zone up here. I love that zone. Even though it does have a giant wick, it's still nice inbounds. Look at that inbounds and order flow, guys. Think about how big a position you would have to trade to create this level of explosive inbounds in the market. Right? Think about that. Like, think about how, how big a position you would have to take to create that level of imbalance. That is a big position. Major institutional selling right here. I can almost guarantee you that there are unfilled orders sitting up here at that level. Either way, we're going to trade the one that's still valid. We can't ignore it, even though it's super beat up. Let's drill down to the weeklies. And what we're going to look for on our intermediate time frame is we're going to look for institu is institutional order flow. We're going to see if there's any correlation, but we're also going to look at trend, right? We're gonna see what the trend is on our intermediate time frame because that's how we determine where the trend is. So here I am on my weeklies. I'm gonna drill down to a line view. You guys tell me in the chat, what is the trend here? Is this an uptrend, a downtrend, or a sideways moving trend? It's a downtrend, yeah. So we've broken past controlling higher lows on the uptrend. That was our controlling higher low right there, right? We've candle closed past it. So the moment we candle closed past this line right here, guys, the moment we candle closed past this line right here, uptrend dead. Because you cannot have an uptrend with a lower low. That breaks the definition of what an uptrend is, right? So as soon as we candle close past that, no more uptrend. You can see the candle right here. Candle closed, not just wick. I have to candle close past it to break the structure, right? So we've candle closed past that. And since that point forward, if I go for my controlling higher high on that uptrend, what have I done? I've done an impulse, a correction, and an impulse. So I have three clear segments of movement establishing a new downtrend. So this is currently a downtrend. Is everybody with me on that? Does everyone understand how I came to that conclusion? Right? Trend is not really up for debate, guys. Trend is actually a clear definition. Now, you can have opinions of saying like, well, even though it's bearish, I think this will happen, and that's fine. But the actual definition of trend is very, very clear. It's not really up for debate. All right, can I ask a question? I'm in with 20K, do you think it's a go up? I don't know, I'd have to go look at it, my man. We can go look at it later. All right, so institutional buying, institutional selling. Let's go back to the candles, and this is where we're gonna look for order flow again, right? We're looking for correlation if there is any. So we don't need this line anymore. Everyone saw the trend, we're good to go. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the weeklies? Hmm, I don't love this structure, but it is structure. This is a rally-based drop right here. I just don't love the way it's structured, but it is what it is, guys. We don't get to choose our zones, we just draw them, right? So this is a rally, base, drop right there. That is an area of institutional selling. What I do like about this zone is this is weekly, monthly correlation. Zones on top of zones, right, guys? And do we like zones on top of zones, guys? We love zones on top of zones, right? Because what do zones on top of zones actually represent? They represent larger imbalances as an order flow. If I have multiple banks and institutions selling at or near the same price point, that means I have an even larger imbalance in order flow at that price. How do you exactly know it's institutional? How on the chart do you know? I've been trading for 26 years, Django. This is what I do for a living, right? Um, I can give you general concepts, but to be very, very clear, guys, you will not learn to trade on a TikTok live or an Instagram live with me. It just takes longer than that. Like that's literally hours and hours of coursework 
weeks and weeks and months and months of training just to teach you how to do this. So I can give you general concepts if I'm looking for an impulsive move, a balance, and then an impulsive move out. Does that make sense? Because what does that really represent? Buyers were in control. They met a wall of sell orders, creating a period of equilibrium where both buyers and sellers were in equilibrium. But eventually there were so many more sellers and buyers that not only did price reverse, right? Stop those buyers in their tracks and reverse. It actually gapped down right here. I don't know if you can see it. It actually gapped down with a pro gap reversal indicating a large imbalance in order flow. So it's just structure. You have to learn structure of order flow. Um, so that would be an area of institutional selling right there, right? Imbalance pushing price action down. Very high probability of there being unfilled sell orders sitting here at this level. And the fact that it correlates with higher time frame structure, weekly, monthly correlation right here where the two zones overlap, that means we have an even larger imbalance in order flow at that point, right? Which is exactly what we look for. We love multiple time frame correlation, right guys? Because that was those create stronger levels of imbalance. All right, so institutional selling right there. Um, sorry, what was that? Can you talk about what you did to get a job at the firm you worked at? I interned there and then I applied after college, man. I interned every, every summer in college. If we wicked into a controlling lower high, does that mean we broke trend? Wicks do not break trend, Greg. Great question though. No problem, man. Yeah, if you guys want to learn more about this, guys, we do actually do a free workshop once a week. You can go and register on our website. Just go to tradephantoms.com. The next workshop is going to be next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. It is free. And if you want to see everything we're covering, just click the purple register here button. And we'll do a deeper dive in all these topics. We teach you more about how the markets act. I don't need you to verify outlook. I hate the way it does that. Oh, that's not right. I have to refresh the page. It's going to be next week. Hold on. I have to go back. I have to refresh the page because I hadn't refreshed the page since last night. There we go. Now it'll work. Um, so that's going to be next Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern. Maybe it'll work. There we go. Now we're good. October 4th. Um, we're going to get into how the markets really work, how professionals trade. Like all the phantoms come from the pro side of the industry, guys. So this is not something where we figured this out on our own or something like that. We worked for investment firms. We, we were trained to do this. So I don't want you to think like, wow, you guys must be geniuses. No, we just did this professionally for a living. <laughs> so we got trained professionally to do it, right? Um, how to trade in all directions, how to use leverage properly, right? If you're trading for income and you're not using leveraged asset class, you're absolutely doing it wrong. Leverage, a lot of times people are afraid of leverage. They think it's scary, but leverage actually helps you reduce your risk, reduce your exposure and generate higher rates of return. So very, very useful, right? The difference between all the different asset classes, stocks, options, futures, forex, crypto, what they're best suited for, and trading for income versus wealth management. So we get into a bunch of stuff. You'll learn a lot more about how the markets work and how professionals actually trade. And for those of you interested in becoming Trade Phantoms Pro members, we offer discounted membership tuition during that workshop as well, because we'd rather you see what we do. Uh, bro, your TikTok about the SP going down, it almost always does in September and then rallies. How long did it take you to learn? So with, with my stock trading man, I was fortunate enough that um, I was taught how to trade stocks correctly from the first time I started trading them. For my Forex trading, what's up, Dean? Yeah, I, I got a few different things to look at first, I'm, I mean, but we can look at different stuff. Please look at the previous controlling lower high on my to see what we had that we have been in downtrend. Yeah, I'm, I'm saying it's a downtrend, Greg. I'm agreeing, downtrend. Um, sorry, what was I saying? I lost my train of thought. I don't remember what I was saying. Whatever, hopefully I'll remember it, whatever. All right, institutional selling right there, pushing price action down. Do I have an institutional buying right here? I do, but this is a rally based rally. This is an area of institutional buying, impulse balance impulse right here, right? Um, these are my problems with this level. First, this candle comes all the way back down to this level right here. So that means the real imbalance in order flow is not coming from up here, it's coming from down here where we have that higher time frame demand zone. So that's the real imbalance pushing the impulse to move up, right? It's not this continuation pattern, it's gaining momentum from down here. Everybody with me? That's my first problem with it. Second problem I have with it is it's been hit once, twice, three times, four times, this is the fifth hit on this weekly demand zone. Do I wanna trade a standalone weekly that's been hit five times, guys? Yeah, yeah, most of the, most of the time the markets are zero sum. It's absolutely right, Abdul. Um, Sometimes, so yes, Taunus, I do, but I do it in my wealth management. I don't do it in my active trading account. 
I do it in my wealth managed account. Your Forex trading. What about Forex trading? Uh, anyway, so I'm not going to trade this level anymore. It's too beat up at this point. Doesn't mean it can't hold. It could still hold. I'm just not going to trade anymore. Either way, we'd rather go short rather than go long, right? But we can't ignore the level just because it's super beat up. We still got to draw it in, right? Awesome, Janoy. Glad to hear that, my man. No, sir, I want to join just to like up right. Cool, man. We'll look forward to having you. There you go, Yoav. You know what I'm talking about. Lost your train. Yeah, yeah, I, I do that all the time, guys. I get distracted and then whatever. <laughs> so, all right. So anyway, let's drill down to the dailies. This is where we're going to look for actionable trade opportunities on our lower time frame, right? Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the follows, guys. We really do appreciate it. It really does help us out when you guys tap the screen. So thank you so much for that. All right, so here I am on the dailies, and same thing, I'm looking for actionable trade opportunities, right? This is my lower time frame. This is where I'm looking for actual trade opportunities. And I do have correlation here. It's not great structure, but this is a drop base drop right here. That is an imbalance in order flow. The reason I don't like it, I don't like the way it pops back up before finally exiting out. But again, guys, we can't ignore zones just because we don't like them. Zones are zones. We gotta draw them as they are, right? So that's an area of institutional selling. What do I like about the zone? Well, that is daily, weekly, monthly correlation. So that is multiple time frame correlation here at this price point. If I can get back to where all three are overlapping each other at 1185, that could be an interesting level for us to potentially go short should price retrace back up there. All this here, blech, that's all gross, gross stuff that we don't want to trade. On the demand side of things, I'm not trading this demand zone. This demand zone's super beat up. I'm not trading this thing at all, right? So I'm done. I'm not, I only, either way, I want to go short, guys. Trend is down. I want to go short. So that's what I would be looking at, Greg. If price retraces back up here to this 1185 price point, that could be an opportunity for us to go short in an area where clearly banks sold heavily, right? High probability of unfilled orders, multiple time frame correlation, good strength of movement, broke past bullish leg in, better than two to one move away. It's checking a lot of boxes, right? I don't love the structure, but it's still pretty tight zone structure. It's not bad for us. Gotta wait. Yep, that's the nat that's the whole nature of how I trade, guys. Like, because you gotta think, I'm more of a swing trader. Like, I'm not like Mr. Blue who does a lot of day trading. So for me, I always wait. I set up trades ahead of time, and sometimes I wait a couple days. Sometimes I wait a couple weeks for my trades to actually trigger. But that's the way I do it. You know, it's for me. I like trading in that manner. I understand that it's not for everybody. If you want to trade more quickly, you're doing the same form of analysis. You're just doing it on lower time frames. Like the trade analysis does not change because you're drilling down lower time frames. Does that make sense, guys? It's just a matter of instead of doing monthlies, weekly, dailies, four hours, maybe you're doing dailies, four hours, one hours, 15 minutes. So it's still the same concept either way. It's just a matter of what time frame you use, right? We get these as a Phantom Elite as well. Uh, Phantom's Elite is more advanced level training cavity. Like you're expected to already be an independent professional trader before you apply to Elite. I wouldn't recommend applying to it unless you already live off your training because it's more advanced level training. Like it's less knowledge and it is just focused purely on finding trade opportunities because no matter how good a trader you are, you can't watch all markets 24 hours a day and neither can I. So the idea of Elite, it's mostly just professional traders who we're all trading together because by working together, we give ourselves more trade opportunities than we would have on our own. Does that make sense? No, it's the same, same analysis, Greg. That's what I mean. So all it means is I'm just drilling down the lower time frames. Yeah, when, when, you got, when people start understanding how the markets work, guys, it, it makes sense because it's, it's, it's logical, right? I recommend swing trading for beginners, SOA day, because day trading, for some reason, people think day trading is lower risk. So a lot of people gravitate towards day trading when they first start trading. But day trading actually requires a lot more discipline to trade properly. Makes sense of the side trade. There you go. Aussie N. Let's go look at Aussie N. When you trade Forex, do you still draw zones as you do or do you pay attention to institutional levels? I do both. I do both those things, you have. My ideal structure are where I have multiple time frame correlation and an institutional number. That's what I really like, right? When you say lower time frame is up, trend is evaluated on in the intermediate time frame, Greg. Always on the intermediate. Reversing, I mean, how do I swing trade and chart it out? You'll have to explain better than that, Spacebo. Can you add SPY to your list, brother? Absolutely, man. 
Yeah, day trading is more complicated, guys. It's the same analysis, but it does require a lot more discipline. So, you know, just one of those things to consider. Oh, that's right, Montu. You did ask me to do IWM. You asked me that. That was like one of the first ones. Let's go look at that. Yeah, that's fine. You can draw lines instead. He prefers to just draw the proximal and distal lines. There's nothing wrong with doing that. That's still the same concept. I like the zone structure because I think it facilitates. Like, you'll notice I make all of my opacity transparent. Like, I don't keep it. Um, where is my structure? I don't keep it at opacity, I keep it at 27%. I do that on purpose because then when I overlap zones, you can I can see clearly the levels where I have multiple time frame correlation. Does that make sense? So I personally prefer to draw it out, but it's a personal preference. Uh, Blue also prefers just to draw the lines. So that's just, it's up to you guys what you prefer. Uh, but it doesn't matter if you wanted to just draw a line here and a line here, that would work too. It doesn't change the structure of the zone, right? All right, so here we are in IWM. We're gonna start as always, guys, on the higher time frames. Why? Because higher time frames tend to control lower time frames. So I always want to be cognizant of what's happening on the higher time frames. I definitely don't want to be the guy who's just looking at five minute, fifteen minute candles and trying to make trading decisions off something when I'm not really getting the full picture, right? Because you don't want to like imagine you're going long on a five minute candle, but you're going long right into a major monthly, weekly, daily level of institutional selling. Probably the higher time frame is going to override your lower time frame structure. Does that make sense? So you want to be, even if you are a scalper, a day trader, you still want to be cognizant of these levels. And what does it take you? An extra two minutes to go and chart it out on your charts? It's worth it. It'll help you in terms of your trading quality, right? So here I am on the monthlies. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the Russell? I do have this impulse balance, impulse area of institutional selling right here. And we can see that price has already come back in once hit those unfilled orders and boom, slammed right back out, right? Because if there's more sellers and buyers, price comes down. And that's the trade we like, guys, right? We like first retests of levels of imbalance because that's where we have the highest probability of an imbalance in order flow. That's where there's the highest imbalance in unfilled orders. That's where we have the highest probability of a good trade to sell together with whatever institution sold here, right? Um, so that one's already been hit once. On the buy side, I have this beautiful drop base rally, nice imbalance in order flow. In this case, institutional buying, more buyers and sellers pushing price action upwards. But did this banker institution fill all their buy orders here, guys? Well, no, they couldn't have possibly filled all their buy orders. If they had filled every order, price would not have exploded upwards. It would have continued to move sideways, right? Because if there are equal numbers of buyers and sellers, price moves sideways. The very fact that we had this impulsive rally out of this zone tells us that there is an imbalance in order flow, in this case, more buyers and sellers pushing price action upwards, leaving this banker institution with a high probability of unfilled orders sitting at this level. To the point that price has already come back down, hit those unfilled orders, and it seems to have already popped back out, right? We'll look at this when we drill down to a lower time frame, but we seem to have already hit that zone. Let's drill down to the weeklies, and what we're looking for on the weeklies is two things, guys. We're looking for trend, and we're looking to see if we have any correlating zone structure. So here I am on the weeklies. Do I have any, well, first of all, what's my trend here on the weeklies, guys? Is this an uptrend, a downtrend, or a sideways moving trend here on IWM? Thank you, Luke C. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's a downtrend. We've broken past controlling higher lows on the uptrend. We've established three clear segments of movement. This is now officially a downtrend. Lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, right? So what does that mean for us as retail traders? That means ideally we would like to go short. Problem is, where are we in terms of the chart? We're in demand, right? So do I wanna go short inside of higher time frame buying? Probably not, right? And now does that mean we can never take a counter trend trade, guys? No, there can be occasions where counter trend trades are justified. They just have to be very, very high scoring zones. The structure has to be really, really good for us to trade counter trend because counter trend trades are lower probability trades. Does that make sense? Uh, so Philando, uh, it's against federal law for traders to tell you earnings representations, lifestyle representations, anything of that nature, win rates, all that stuff. That goes against federal law 15.USC.45. That's why you don't really see professional traders ever talk about stuff like that. Because if you've ever worked at an investment firm or an investment bank, part of your training was compliance training. Um, so professional traders, because they know it's like it's a significant fine that you leave yourself susceptible to, um, because they're aware of that, 
it's really difficult to see professional traders ever talk about earnings or lifestyle. Like they're usually very careful in terms of how they speak of trading and stuff, right? It's not even the jail. They don't put you in jail. They fine you. It's a, it's a big fine. I don't want to, I don't want to pay the fine. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> I love that. I know the law number now, guys. I only know the law number because of TikTok and Instagram. I've never known it before. 14 would be the lowest I would ever trade. How do you refine your entry point as a swing trader? It uh, doesn't matter for Lando. Yeah, I know. People think that if they say, uh, not financial advice, guys, that it somehow protects them from law. That is not any protection. That's retail traders that have convinced each other that as long as they say not financial advice, that they're protected. They're not even remotely protected. Completely susceptible. They can get fined easily. <laughs> that offers 0% protection in the law. I find it hilarious. Every time I see it, I'll go on these lives like, listen, guys, this is not financial advice. And it's like, yeah, did you talk to a lawyer about that? Because <laughs> that disclaimer means diddly in the eyes of the FTC. <laughs> they could care less. Uh, if we're taking a confirmation trade, that's what we do, man. I do not do spreads, Eastern. That's more blues game. I don't do spreads personally. Uh, nothing against them. It's just not my thing. They wouldn't find you. They would find me, my man. Oh, you're saying if you were making earnings? Yeah, and you'll see people do that overseas, man. Uh, this is a U.S. law, right? Um, some countries have these laws. Some countries don't. But in the U.S., it's against federal law. So uh, you'll never see me do it is the best way. I can. And, and to be very frank, guys, it's not real. Like my results are not even close to being a guarantee of your results. Uh, that's something that people don't get. Like, just because I know how to trade, that doesn't mean you're going to put the time and effort in to learn how to trade. The way I put this to people so they understand is like, you can go to a gym and you can hire the best trainer in there, the one that's in the best shape, super cut, super chiseled, muscular with 1% body fat. That doesn't mean you are guaranteed to lose 20 pounds and get a six pack. You still have to actually do the work, right? There's no shortcuts to it. And trading is no different. Just because I know how to trade, that doesn't mean you're going to go and take the time to learn and practice and do it. You still got to go and get up on the treadmill and diet and exercise and lift the weights. And some people will do that work. Most people won't. Most people give up, right? Like I was just looking at the statistics of people who drop out of phantoms. Most people drop out within the first few weeks. Like they give up after the first few weeks. The second big hurdle for people is at like the three, four month mark where they think, oh, I've learned all the mechanics. I need everything. I have everything I need. It's like, dude, you're, you're, you're a baby. You're a baby just starting to learn to crawl. And you're like, huh, I'm not running like a gazelle yet. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not even close. It took me nine months, guys, for me to get to a level with my forex trading. And I'm saying nine months trading every day consistently, never skipping a day. It took me nine months to get to a point where I could count on it as a consistent stream of revenue. It took, uh, Green, about a year. It took Blue almost two years. And Blue's one of the best traders I know. That's the reality of it, guys. It's just not that fast. This is one of the highest paying skill sets in the world. So I try and set expectations with people like, if I told you it will take you a year of working and practicing and putting in time at least four to six hours every week for you to learn a skill set that could have you be financially independent for the rest of your life, would you be willing to put that time in? And some people are like, yeah, I would. Some people are like, no, I wouldn't. And those are people that should not trade because that's the reality of trading. It just takes time, guys. It's not that easy. I wish it was easier, but it's not. This takes time and effort to learn. If you're willing to learn it, it's not beyond your abilities because trading is extremely, extremely systematic. It's very process oriented. When A happens, you do B. When B happens, you do C and so on and so forth. But you got to put the time and effort in. The same way you can't learn to speak a foreign language in a couple weeks or a couple months. Like you're not going to be fluent in German after three months, right? It's going to take you a little bit longer than that to be fluent in German. That's just the reality of it, unless you already speak German. Anyway, back to the Russell. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the weeklies? I do. I have this impulse balance, impulse area of institutional demand here, pushing price action upwards. And that is weekly monthly correlation. We have already come back in. I assume you mean ETFs. Um, Forex would be more well suited for someone who works a full time job, man. That's what I used to do. That was where I first started trading um, more actively was during Forex because I would be able to do that at night. I would do that after work. So we have this area of balance. 
And why do we like zones on top of zones, guys? Well, this chart could not make it clearer, right? Why do we like zones on top of zones? Because when you have multiple time frame correlation, right? Here we have weekly, monthly correlation. It creates stronger levels of imbalance and order flow. If I have multiple banks and institutions buying at or near the same price point where those zones overlap, it means I have an even larger imbalance, even more buyers and sellers, right? So you can see when price came back in, it's already hit it. It came back in and hit those unfilled orders. Where did it turn, guys? Where did it turn? It turned right where the zones overlap each other. Can everyone see that? Yeah, there you go, Dean. We love them, right? Does everyone see that's where it turned? That's why we like zones on top of zones. And if you took this trade, I think you would have already locked in the one-to-one -one on the move. Does that make sense? So that, yeah, you would have locked in the one-to-one. -one. That's the concept of it. So if you were trading the zone, I did not trade the zone, guys. I don't look at the Russell very often. But just to be clear, if you did trade way too late, it already moved out. Yeah, yeah, way, way too late. The time to take, I mean, time to have taken this was a week ago, which we already had the zones run. I haven't looked at the Russell in a while, guys. But either way, you get the point. That's where you would have gotten in. That's the area. That's the first retouch of this demand zone after it exited. It came back in and right where we have daily, weekly, monthly correlation, right where all three zones overlap, where did it turn? Right there. Does that make sense to everybody? That's why we like multiple time frame correlation. It's stronger levels of imbalance. So beautiful imbalance already popped back up. And if you were trading this trade, if you're in it already, if you took it, because I mean, we did this analysis a while ago, guys. If you took this trade here, you should lock in your profit. You should take your one-to-one -one move away, move your remaining stop losses to break even, and then ride the rest with just uh, house money, right? Because you would already have made profit on this trade. Are you looking at a trend change in a doji to mark your level? I still don't understand how. Yeah, it's it's hard to understand quite that easily, Spacebo. It's literally hours and hours of coursework that you're asking me to summarize. Um, so again, I, I can't teach you that easily. It's just not that simple. It takes a while to learn how to do this. That's the reality of it. I can give you general concepts, but again, you're not gonna learn to do it sitting here on TikTok or Instagram with me, guys. Like, uh, to be clear, guys, Everything I do here on TikTok, on Instagram, on whatever this other one is, Clapper, this is step one. And what do I mean by that? Is it important to learn step one? Of course it's important to learn step one. But if I was teaching you like the alphabet of trading, all this stuff is like the letter A. It's a great start to the alphabet, but there is way more beyond this in terms of identifying institutional order flow and actually drawing zone structure and which trades are valuable, which way trades are not. I don't want you guys to think this is the end all be all. This is just the first step of many that we take to evaluate trades. I certainly don't want you guys thinking every time you see small body candles, big moves, price comes back, you're in. No, there's way more to it beyond that. Most zones are not tradable. I don't even draw most zones, guys. Like that structure, that structure, that structure, that structure, that structure, that structure, that there's plenty of zones that I don't draw. So I don't want you guys to think that, oh, it's as simple as that. It's so much more to it. I've just been trading long enough that I don't even waste my time drawing zones that are garbage. Does that make sense? Because I've been doing it long enough. I, I don't need to draw them to know if they're good or not. I already can identify them. Anyway, so I already hit there. Let's drill down to the dailies and we'll see if there's anything. Oh, well, first of all, um, what was, did we already do trend on this, guys? I forget if we did trend on the Russell. Yeah, we did, downtrend. Uh, let's drill down to the dailies. And this is where we're gonna look for an actionable trade opportunity. This demand zone's dead. That's why you don't like standalone dailies as much. I mean, there's the supply zone up here that's already been hit, so that's too bad. Um, I mean, yeah, we have this little rally-based drop, but it's really a retest of this rally-based drop, right? And this is really a retest. Oh, it's so close of this continuation pattern, drop-based drop right there. For me, when you get priced that close, guys, when it like comes to this level and then bounces back out, I would consider that a hit. Does that make sense, everybody? Because look at what happened. Price came back up, basically touched it, and then slammed down. To me, that's a hit of that level. I would consider that a hit. Even though it didn't technically hit, at the end of the day, do we really know precisely to the penny exactly where bank institutions are buying every single time? No, we're, we're doing analysis as close as we can get. And most of the time we're gonna be right on the price, but sometimes you might buy, be off by a few pennies and that's just the reality of it, right? 
So for me, you have to have a little bit of common sense too, where you go, man, this came almost exactly to the point and then slammed down. To me, that means it hit the unfilled orders. Does that make sense? And that means my zone structure is just slightly different. It would be like that instead of like that. That's what I would think. Everybody with me on that, right? So I'm not gonna trade that supply zone again. It's already been hit. Um, there's a little bit of a continuation right here, a little bit of drop base drop. I have to see what this looks like in a detailed time frame because when all my candles are the same structure, same color, I have to make sure there's an actual area of hesitation there. That because especially when you're drilling onto lower time frames, and there is, there's this rally based drop. So that is institutional order flow. There's no fundamental justifying it. So this is an actual bank or institution selling right here. That's my most actionable trade opportunity, guys. If I can get back up to this level right here, where I have four hour, one, hour, one day correlation at the 182.38, that could be an interesting level for us to go short. I'm not gonna trade the demand zone. The demand zone is counter trend and we're already late. The time to have traded it was down here. If you took it, good for you. At this point, you missed it. So if you're not in this trade already, you should not enter it now. Because um, this is too much risk for this tiny amount of profit. That doesn't make sense. But if I can get back up here, that's nice tight zone structure, great strength of movement, better than a three to one if you're taking this smaller time frame zone structure right there. So pretty good, that's where I would be looking at. Obviously you have to wait for price to retrace to see how it retraces as that could affect our risk to reward ratio, right? So like if I come back up and I set up a demand zone right here, well then this zone doesn't matter to me because my profit is too little. And that's a big important part of trading guys, right? Trading is not just about finding trades that are high probability. Obviously that's an important part. You have to learn how to analyze the charts and find high probability trades. But there's also the second very critical part of trading, which is making sure you're filtering out trades that have low risk with high proportionate profit targets. Because no matter how good a trader you are, you can be the best trader in the world, the best analyst in the world, you're still not gonna win every trade, right? Vanguard doesn't win every trade. BlackRock doesn't win every trade. UBS doesn't win every trade. So if the biggest investment firms in the world with trillions of dollars don't win every trade, it stands to reason that we as well will not win every trade, right? Because at, at the end of the day, what is trading? Trading is at its heart, probability analysis, right? When we go and we do our analysis on the charts, even if I dot all my I's, cross my T's and find a perfect trade setup that just looks beautiful, does that mean that trade is guaranteed to win just because it looks perfect? No, it might win, it might lose. That's the nature of trading, right? So what professional traders do is, yeah, we filter out trades that are high probability, but we take it a step further and say, of these trades that are high probability, which ones have the lowest risk with the highest proportion of profit targets? Which ones have the best reward to risk ratios? And ideally, we wanna look for trades that have reward to risk ratios of at least three to one. In other words, our profit targets are at least three times our risk or more. The reason this is so critical is if you trade in this manner, where you never over leverage, you never over position, you take trades equally, and you only take trades with low risk and high profit targets, what that means is when you lose, not if you lose, because I don't care how good a trader you are, you will lose trades, when you lose, you lose little. And when you win, you're maximizing your profits. That's the nature of trading. It's not that we win every trade, guys. Professional traders lose trades too, but what we're good at doing is we don't hold on to losing trades. Before we even get into a trade, we have already determined our entry, we've already determined our stop loss, and we've already determined our profit target. That's how we determine if a trade is worth taking or not. If it does not meet our risk reward ratio parameters and our position size parameters, we don't take the trade. It's that cut and dry. It's like, oh, but Mr. Black, it's a beautiful zone. It looks so good. It's a one-to-one, -one, but it's so good. It scored a 20 out of 20. Cool. I wouldn't take that trade because the whole nature of trading is I only take trades that are high probability guys, right? I never take a trade that's a low probability trade. That's a waste of time. Why would I take that? So I don't wanna take trades that are low probability trades. I only take high probability trades, but then I have to take that extra step of saying, of these high probability trades, which ones have the best reward to risk ratios, right? Exactly right, Fly. If you trade three to ones, guys, and you never over position, you treat all your trades equally, you can be wrong up to 70% of the time and still be profitable. And that's a big deal. If you are someone who is still trying to learn to trade and establish consistency in the markets, Imagine being wrong seven out of every 10 trades you place. You're only right 30% of the time, three out of 10 trades, but you're still making money. That's a great position to be in as you're learning, right? Now, do should you work on improving your win rate if you're only winning 30% of your trades? Of course you should. 
But it's nice to be able to do that from a position where you're actually seeing returns rather than losing money, right? So very, very critical aspect of trading. It's not just about the chart analysis. It's that second step of making sure you're taking trades with low risk, high profit targets, right? And then having the discipline, then being disciplined in taking those trades. Um, it depends Eastern, it depends on the asset I'm trading, time frame I'm trading, things that nature. No, there's more factors that go into it. That's initial looks, but it does get deeper than that when you start getting to the different specialization classes, right? All right, so anyway, um, that's what I would look at here on IWM, man. And I actually think that's an interesting level. That's actually an intro, that's interesting enough that I'm actually gonna take a screenshot of it. I'm gonna do a deeper dive. And when price gets back close to these levels, guys, that's when we look at um, technicals. Cause like, even though we don't make our trading decisions off technical analysis, does that mean we don't use technical analysis? No, we use it every day, guys. We just know that it's very inconsistent as a standalone form of analysis. So there's nothing wrong with learning how to use indicators and oscillators, things of nature, just don't blindly trust in them because they don't work as standalone forms of analysis. But I don't mind them as a confirmation, right? As an extra little check mark next to my trade. Binary options is garbage piece. Don't, don't trade binary options. That's just a scam to take your money. It's not a real market. To be clear, guys, binary options is not a real market. Options, real market. Binary options, garbage. People think you always have to trade every day. Less is more interesting. Absolutely, Jay. The last two weeks of trading equities, I've been trading very few equities trades because of the structure of the market, right? Now we're finally breaking through levels and I'm finding having trades again. But for two weeks, I was almost sitting on my hands for all my equities trades. I was just trading Forex, right? I placed like one or two trades. That's how little I was trading. Yeah, life. Yeah, you have to know how to do chart analysis, man. And that's how you identify institutional order flow and that's how you identify risk reward ratios. Like to be clear, guys, we do not determine where our entries are, where our stop losses are, where our targets are, the banks do. All we do is we analyze where they're buying and selling and see if they fit within our risk word ratio parameters or not. Would be ideal starting your teachings. I mean, it's nothing to do with us, my man. Uh, what asset class are you trading? After I run my analysis on this. Sure, uh, well, I'm done with this. I'm done with IWM. What do you guys wanna check out next? We can look at Neo. We can look at SPY. Let's go look at SPY and we'll look at NEO. Let's do those both. All right, so let's go look at SPY first and then we'll do NEO after. Sure, Mitron, we can look at GRTS. Aussie Yen, Dollar Yen, Euro Pound. We got lots to look at, huh? Meta. All right, cool. So here we are on SPY. Let's start on the higher time frames. As always, guys, higher time frames control lower time frames. So we want to start from top down. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on SPY? And for those of you who took that short with us, you probably love us now, right? If you're still in it. I'm closed out, to be clear. I closed out at the demand zone here on the weekly. It's already delimited because we've broken through, but there was a demand zone right here. Um, do I have any clear institutional order flow here? I do have impulse, balance, impulse, air of institutional selling, pushing price action down, impulse, balance, impulse, air of institutional buying, pushing price action up. Price has already come back, hit that demand zone, popped right back up, come back in, hit that supply zone, popped right back down, right? Is Forex a scam? No, Forex is the largest market in the world, my man. That's the currency market. That's where banks and institutions invest the majority of their money. Not at all scam, biggest market in the world. I saw some moron, dude, the other day. Uh, dude, you know what's the worst? The worst is seeing people who don't know what they're talking about, but speak with like conviction. Like uh, some random guy, I, what, uh, you just reminded me of peace because he said he was saying that like, Forex is a scam, the only markets that matter. What did he say? I'm trying to remember, he said stocks. And then, oh, I, I don't remember if he liked futures or options. One or the other, one of them he thought was horrible when he liked. And I'm like, they're both contracts, dude. Like, it was just so stupid. He's like, there's no real value. And I'm like, there's no value in currencies. <laughs> that's, that's literally where value is derived from. <laughs> it's what's the associated cash value of whatever you're trading. That's what a currency is. But it was just like, and I'm like, what you're saying doesn't make sense, man. And he got so angry. He was like, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to school you something now, son. And I'm like, all right, dude. You know? <laughs> And then he ended up booting me out. He didn't like me. <laughs> but anyway, it was just like, it was so bad, dude. Like, I was just like, this is, these are people are just 
spewing garbage as if they have any knowledge of stuff. And that's the thing that sucks about the internet, right? Anybody can say whatever they want. And as long as they speak with enough conviction, there will be people that believe them. That's just the reality of the world, right? So I encourage you guys to go and, you know, do research for yourself. Don't blindly follow anybody because most of these people don't know diddly about what they're talking about. Anyway, all right, here we are in the monthlies, institutional buying, institutional selling, let's drill down to the weeklies. Weeklies, we're looking for trend and we're looking for correlation, right guys? Trend and correlation. So what is my trend here on the weeklies for spies? Is this an uptrend, downtrend, or sideways moving trend? Yeah, 100%, Mr. X, that's right. They'll believe and they'll get scammed. And that's, I mean, no matter how much, I mean, today's actually been pretty chill. We haven't had any real trolls in the room, right? Um, but no matter how much, there's always going to be people who will have, who said it beautifully yesterday, cognitive dissonance, right? They can't accept something that they are not familiar with and they can't set their egos to the side. So they just struggle with that. Uh, if I can understand charts, do I need to watch the news? Yes, you need to be aware of everything, peace. You can't, you can't live in a bubble, right? I'm not saying you make your trading decisions off fundamentals, but you gotta be aware of them, right? Like I literally have my second tab right here, guys. What's my second tab? My second tab is the economic calendar. Does that make sense? That's how important it is to me. I have to be aware of what's happening in the world. You can't ignore that. Fair enough? I'm not saying you need to read an individual news about the CEO of blah, blah, blah company and caught a cold today. Who cares about that? You know, I'm saying you need to be aware of major economic news. Um, so this is a downtrend, right? We've broken past controlling higher lows on this uptrend. We've established an impulse, a correction, an impulse, new lower lows, lower highs, lower lows, lower highs, lower lows. This is now a downtrend. Is everyone with me on that? We have reversed direction. So clear, clear downtrend. What does that mean for us as retail traders? That means ideally we would like to go short, right? We'd rather trade with trend than against trend because trend trades are higher probability trades. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here? Um, I mean, obviously down here we have this drop based rally, but it's already been retouched once, right? See price exited out, came back in, hit those unfilled orders and popped back up, right? So this zone's already been hit once. On the supply side, not great structure, really. I mean, really, this is a retest of this continuation pattern. Can everyone see that? I have this drop, base, drop. Inmount and order flow right here. Some institutions sold, creating an inmount and order flow, pushing price action down, leaving that banker institution with unfilled orders at this level. So when price got pushed back in, why did it get pushed back in, guys? Because of institutional buying right here, right? Hit those unfilled buy orders got pushed right back up, hit those unfilled sell orders left over from here and boom, right back down. So my issue is my most recent supply zone has already been hit once, right? No indicators on the charts, my man. Shorting is making money as the market goes down, Crimson. Um, watch CCL tomorrow before open, okay. Um, let's drill down to the dailies. And what we're looking for on the dailies is an actionable trade opportunity, right? On a lower time frame is where we're looking for an actionable trade opportunity. So do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the dailies? And I do. I have this drop base drop right here. That is a level of imbalance. That's our most recent structure. Obviously we have correlation here, but this is a retest of that. We've already beaten it up a little bit. This right here is valid and hasn't been broken. It is a good imbalance in order flow. So that's an interesting level right there on SPY, if we can get back up there. On the demand side, we're in it. We're in a demand zone right now. This is a rally base rally right here. Can everyone see that? Rally base rally. This is an area of institutional demand and we're sitting in it right now. So uh, this zone's already hit. We're not gonna trade it. It's way too close to supply. Like that. that's not enough profit for this amount of risk, right guys? And like I said before, just because we see a zone, does that mean we trade it? No, I have to see if there's enough profit for me, if it's worth trading. And where this is right now, this is not a trade I would take. But either way, if we can get back up here, that's interesting. That 442.68 price point, that's one I would consider. Down here, we have this multiple time frame correlation as well. Right here, where we have the daily monthly correlation at the 418.28. Well, really, they overlap each other where? They overlap each other at 417.85 that would be an interesting opportunity to go along. So I have two opportunities here on SPY guys. 
Uh, overall trend is down, so obviously we would prefer to go short if price retraces. But I'm not necessarily against this counter trend trade here. This is a nice level of imbalance here, multiple time frame correlation, good strength of movement, broke past the bearish leg in, very little time spent. It's checking a lot of boxes for us right here. So even though this is a counter trend trade down here, I would still consider it. Obviously the higher probability trade will be the short up there, right? Are those order blocks or something? Yeah, kind of, man. Uh, so I, I, I'm always careful with the words I use. This is institutional order flow, right? So I, I don't want you to think all order blocks matter to us because they don't. I don't really care, for example, if the CFO of some company decides to go and buy 20,000 shares of the company. Is that an order block? It's an order block, but it's not an order block that matters to me. The only ones I really care about are institutional order flow, right? That's all that I care about. And here we are in the fours, my man. I mean, fours are not really going to change. It's just going to be the same structure, rally-based drop. Does that make sense? There's the little area of the miles. And really, it's a drop-based drop right here as well. So we can draw it in, and you can see there's a correlation right there. So it's just going to tighten the structure very slightly. I mean, instead of it being, what was the original price? This is 442.68, and this other one was what? Trying to click on it. It's really not wanting me to click on it. No, that's not it. 442.92. So you're talking, you know, whatever, 30 cents difference. Um, I would still trade the other one. I wouldn't ignore the daily to go to that four hour. Does that make sense? It's neither one, man. It's not ICT or SMC. I actually worked in an investment firm. I've never learned from any of these random retail traders that pretend to trade. That's SPY. That is SPY. That is correct. All right, so there we go. That's what I got for you on SPY, guys. What do you guys want to do next? NEO. That's right, my man. Let's go look at NEO. All right. Let's go look at some EV. So here we are, NEO. Yeah, if you guys want to learn more about this, guys, we teach a free workshop once a week. The next workshop is going to be Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you would like to register, it is free. You can just register directly on our website, tradephantoms.com. And to register, you just click the purple register here button. And in that workshop, we do a deeper dive in all this stuff, guys. So if you're still trying to understand institutional order flow, how professionals trade, in that workshop, we do a deeper dive into it. We explain more how the markets actually work, how professionals trade, right? How we're analyzing the markets, finding where banks and institutions are buying and selling so we can buy and sell with them instead of chasing price action how to trade in all directions, how to use leverage properly so you can reduce your risk, reduce your exposure and generate high rates of return. If you're trading for income, you should absolutely be using a leveraged asset class. It's a very powerful tool when used correctly. The difference between all the different asset classes, stocks, options, futures, forex, crypto, and what they're best suited for, and trading for income versus wealth management. So we do a much deeper dive into what it's like to trade at a professional level. You'll learn a lot more about the markets and how professionals actually trade and analyze. And for those of you interested in becoming Phantoms members, we offer a discounted tuition for membership during the workshop. All right. All right. So here we are in NEO. Let's start from scratch, guys, because a lot of stuff has changed since we last looked at this. Let's start on the monthlies. And what we're looking for is institutional order flow. No, Oscar. I mean, we, we if you have questions and you need help with stuff, we'll speak with you on the phone. But I don't have the time to teach people one-on-one. -on -one. That would be a tremendous waste of my time. What's the definition of a leveraged asset class? Options, futures, and Forex are leveraged asset classes. All right, so here we are on the monthlies. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on NEO? I do, I have this beautiful drop base rally. Nice area of imbalance. Some big bank institution bought heavily here, driving price action upwards, right? How about on the sell side? Well, on the sell side, I have this drop base drop. But if you look at this wick, this is really a retest of this, which is really a retest of that, right? Drop base drop. So that's the real level of imbalance over here to the left. And then it's been hit multiple times since it was first created, right? Some big bank institution sold here, pushing price action down, leaving unfilled sell orders sitting at this level. So when price came back in, it hit those unfilled sell orders and popped back out. And then it came back in and popped back out. And then it came back in and popped back out. So lots of institutional selling there. It's been 
super beat up at this point though, right? Super beat up. Where am I from? The United States, man. Don't need none of this. All you need is safetytrade.com. Real results. Not complicated like that. <laughs> Gee, I wonder if you are a shill for safetytrade.com. <laughs> Clearly a genuine, genuine testimonial, guys. <laughs> I like when people do that sort of stuff. It's very funny. Uh, no, no need to learn, guys. Just follow this other guy blindly. I'm sure it'll work out brilliantly. So place trades, look at TradingView. Wait, place trades on TradingView itself. Uh, I don't know. You can connect TradingView to some brokers. I guess it would depend on what broker you use, man, and if the broker is accessible to trade through TradingView. No, just not trying to sell this to you guys. Sure, man. I believe you. Well, it is cheap. Nine ninety nine a month is pretty cheap, man. You get what you pay for, right? I don't know, man. I, I, I don't know what he does. I, I've never seen the safety trade. I, the very name of it sounds weird to me, but I don't know what they do. I would have to see how they trade. Maybe they're great traders. I have no idea. All right, so here we are on the monthlies. Let's drill down to the weeklies. And this is where we're going to look for actionable trade opportunities, right, guy? Well, not actionable. Pardon me. This is where we're going to look for trend and correlation. Then we're going to drill down to the dailies. How do I identify institution order? Not overflow, order flow. How much is your course? Oh, pro membership is normally $1.99 a month, Oscar. Um, during the workshop, we offer a 40 to 50% off promotion. And if you do take advantage of that, you are grandfathered in at that price point as well. Yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer you should learn to trade. The very way you are speaking of trading would be a tremendous turnoff for me if I was trying to learn to trade, just so you know. I understand that you probably think people want to hear, it's super easy, just come follow us. And there are people that will believe that. But you got to think the type of person that's believing that. Anybody who's believing that you're going to just blindly copy stuff and it's super easy to trade is a little naive about what trading is, right? What score do you usually trade for zones? I look for the highest scores I can get, Luis. It's not... I've been trading for a while now. Yeah, trading's not easy, guys. It takes time. I, I don't care what people on the internet will represent. They are lying to you. It's just not that simple. No, you're grandfathered in at that price point, Limo. Whatever price point you did, you're, you're grandfathered in. <laughs> okay, dude. <laughs> yeah, well, as much as your generic username gives me confidence, my man, I think I'll stick with the thing that's been working for me for the last 26 years. But thanks for the advice. <laughs> Not really needing it, but thanks. I think I'll just stick with the thing that already works. Um, all right, here I am in the weeklies. Do Well, first off, what is my trend here, guys? Is this an uptrend, a downtrend, or a sideways moving trend? What's the deal here on NEO? Up, down, or sideways? Mm, That's an interesting one. So this is an interesting one because of this. This is not really a clear correction. So this is still technically an uptrend, guys. There you go, Julio. Yes, still technically an uptrend. Oh, dude, okay. I mean, as much as you're trying to sell the garbage, uh, you're pushing it now. I was, I was giving you the benefit of the doubt, but now you're just pushing it too much. So... Best of luck with your crap program. Go push your crap somewhere else. This is not the place for you. The very way you're trying to sell it, even though I've never seen the guy trade, makes me think that it's garbage because nobody should ever try and sell their program like that. Um, all right. Yeah, it's still an uptrend. It's barely an uptrend, but it is still an uptrend. So what does that mean for us? That means ideally we would like to go long, right? We'd rather trade with trend than against trend. Those are higher probability trades. So do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the weeklies? Oh, man, it's already bounced. It didn't quite hit though, right, guys? That's what that sometimes happens, guys. Sometimes you'll get very, very close and not hit. 
And unfortunately, I think that's the case here. I think we've already bounced off the level, right? I understand that it's not quite hitting the zone, but you gotta think, what's the low on this? 793, what's the entry here? 783, 10 cents. I mean, it's not nothing, but it's already bounced right back up. I gotta, I would think of that as a hit. That's so close, I would think of that as a hit, right? So um, I wouldn't trade that long anymore at this point. We've kind of missed that trade. On the supply side, we have a little bit of a drop-based drop right here, but really this rally-based drop is the better structure. That's area of institutional selling. Let's drill down to the dailies, and this is where we're gonna look for actionable trade opportunities, guys. Let's see if the dailies give us anything better. Yeah, yeah, dude, I, I don't, I don't think that's a smart way of talking. Uh, I mean, people can sell whatever they want to sell, however they want to sell it. But at the end of the day, I think most people recognize that if people are promising you the world, it's probably bullshit. <laughs> Look, you, you'll notice I don't promise you guys diddly, right? I don't promise diddly. I say you guys are going to have to do a lot of work to learn how to do it. If you want to learn, we'll teach you. But I don't tell you guys, I don't sugarcoat it for you guys because we all trade, guys. It's it's not easy to trade. Trading takes time and effort. So it's like either you want to do the work or you don't. Never heard of it, man. The workshop is once a week, Oscar. Uh, all right. Uh, I mean, dude, uh, we don't want to trade counter trend. Either way, this has been hit. This has been hit. This has been hit. Everything's beat up. There's just nothing I want to trade here, man. There's nothing I want to trade here. I don't like the structure of this. This little demand zone already bounced off once and then broke. There's just nothing I want to trade here. I don't want to trade. I don't want to take any of these trades. So I'm sorry, man. I don't have anything for you on this chart. I wouldn't trade it right now. There's nothing actionable for me. Yeah, we trade crypto and Forex. We trade all asset classes, guys. Stocks, options, futures, Forex, crypto. We trade it all. Can you take a look at dollar cad? I think I have some other forex pairs to look at before. Wasn't there like dollar yen or something? Dollar yen, pound yen, something like that. See you, Montu. Take it easy, brother. Aussie yen. That's what you'd ask fly. Let's go look at Aussie yen. And then we'll look at the other ones. All right. So Aussie yen. For those of you who don't trade forex, forex is the currency market. It is also the largest market in the world. This is where banks and institutions invest the majority of their money. It's a great income generating asset class. It is more well suited towards swing trading than day trading though. I know some people try and day trade Forex and it's not to say that you can't. I did it myself when I first started trading Forex, but just the nature of how it moves, it is a little more well suited towards swing trading. Um, all right, so here we are. Let's start on the monthlies. Man, is that supply zone beat up, huh? Look at that supply zone, guys. Look at how many times it's come in and out, 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 in and out. Man, that zone has been beat up, huh? Anyway, all right, so here we are in the monthlies. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on OCN? You better believe it. I have this beautiful rally base rally, nice area of institutional buying, pushing price action upwards explosively. And then apparently back here, I have this beautiful look at that. That's about as nice as it gets as far as structure goes, right? Rally, base, drop, big imbalance in order flow. Some big bank institutions sold and sold heavily here, pushing price action down, right? So institutional selling, institutional buying. Let's drill down to, we don't need this line anymore. I was, I'm sure I was making some point at some point with someone. Uh, let's drill down to the weeklies. And what we're looking for here is trend and correlation, guys, right? Trend and correlation. Yeah, most liquid market in the world. Absolutely, man. Forks is a great, great income generating asset class. It is more well suited towards swing trading. The other cool thing about Forex, guys, is it's the only market where it genuinely does not matter how much money you have. If you have, you know, $5 million or you have $500, those two traders can take the exact same trade set up in the Forex market. They can take the same entry, same stop loss, same profit target, because you can adjust the value of a price interest point to whatever you want it to be in Forex. So that's one of the really cool things about Forex is it gives you that flexibility. So like when I first started trading Forex 25 years ago, guys, so a while back, right? I would actually risk $1 to try and make $3 or more. 
Now, this was not a lack of capital. I had more money to put into the market. It wasn't because I couldn't invest more. The reason I started so conservatively is I knew I wouldn't be emotional about it, right? Like if I lost a buck, did I care? Not even a little bit. Didn't affect my life whatsoever. If I had a profit target of $3 and I was up like $2.80 and then instead of hitting my profit target, it started pulling back against me, $2.70, $2.60, $2.50. Was I like, oh my God, I got to lock in my $2.50? No, I didn't care about it. It wasn't enough money to make me emotional. So it allowed me to trade live. Like it wasn't theoretical trading, wasn't paper trading. It was actual live market trading, but I was trading with very small amounts of money. And what's cool about trading in that manner is if you can establish consistency trading $1 for $3, where after wins and losses, you're consistently hitting your profit targets, those are the exact same mechanics as if you were trading 100 for $300 or 1,000 for $3,000. The trade itself doesn't change, just how much capital you put on the trade changes. Does that make sense, everyone? So very, very cool income generating asset class. It's really the only market where it genuinely doesn't matter how much money you have. Yep, there's no pattern day trader rule in Forex, S0888. No pattern day trader in, in Forex. You can trade as many day trades as you want, in and out as many times as you want. All right, so here we are in the weeklies for Aussie First things first, what is my trend here on the weeklies, guys? Is this an uptrend, a downtrend, or a sideways moving trend? What do you guys think? Up, down, or sideways? Uh, leveraged asset class, uh, like stock, like Forex options and futures are leveraged asset class. Uh, that's an interesting question, man. What a busy day in the Phantoms training today. Awesome, brother. Good to see you, Sam. Um, yeah, it's still an uptrend. I don't have a preference over Forex and options. Somebody asked me this a while ago, like probably about two months ago. Someone asked me that exact same question here on TikTok. Good, man. That's good. That means you're growing, right? If you're outside of your comfort zone, you're growing. Um, and then somebody asked me, well, if you had to choose between the two. And the funny thing is I probably trade Forex more actively day to day, but if I had to choose between the two, I would probably choose options just because it's a little more versatile. Um, so I love Forex, I trade it every day. I think it's a great starting point for most people who are learning to trade, but um, I would prefer uh, options if I had to choose between the two of them because I think it would be the best bang for my buck and the most versatility in terms of trading, right? Because you can use options for obviously day trading, you can use it for swing trading, you can use it for intermediate long-term positioning, you can use it for wealth management, you can use it for protection. There's just a lot of stuff you can do with options that you can't really do with other asset classes, right? Yeah, Sam's a member, Cavity. There are lots of members in the room. At least I think so. There's usually lots of members in the room, guys. If you ever wanna hear what people think about us, just ask people in the room. Because there are plenty of members in the room that can tell you what they think about us. All right. Um, and if you like reviews, you can also read our reviews on Trustpilot. We have an excellent rating on Trustpilot. Fly as a member as well. Uh, so uptrend, that means we would like to go long. Problem is, I want to go long, but where am I, guys? I'm in monthly supply. So it's not my best area to go long in, right? That means I'm going to need to wait for price to retrace back down to an area of demand to see if I have an opportunity to go long. Where I am right now, I can't really go long. At least I shouldn't go long. I can. I can do whatever I want, but I wouldn't do it, right? Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the weeklies? I have this structure right here, but I'm not gonna draw it yet because it's too close to supply. And until I've broken this monthly supply, I would never trade a lower time frame demand zone right inside of monthly supply, right? So I wouldn't trade that level. Um, down here, we have this other rally-based rally, but you can see this wick has to come back down here to actually gain momentum to gain this and push this price action upwards. So the real imbalance is at this continuation pattern, this rally base rally. And that's our most recent level of institutional demand that's still good for us to trade. It has been hit once, but that's our most recent one. It's also weekly monthly correlation, right? On the supply side, I'm technically in a zone right now. I'm in this little drop base drop right here, right? Everyone see that right there? Little impulse, balance, impulse, and we're in it right now. Now, would I put a lot of faith in this supply zone that's been hit once, twice, three times, four times, now it's the fifth time? I would not. 
I would not put a lot of faith in the zone that's been hit that many times, right? Highest winning and streak and losing streak. I don't know, man. I never kept track of it. I know earlier this year I had a streak of my options trades where I won like 27 in a row. I know because I was bragging it about it. So <laughs> take that what you will. Have you trade short-term hedge investments? Uh, not really, man. I don't really do hedging. Yep. Cool. All right. Let's keep going. So anyway, uh, I wouldn't trade the supply zone. The supply zone's super beat up at this point. That's one, two, three, four. This is the fifth hit on a stand. Well, it's not standalone. It's inside of higher structure, but I would not trade it. I would not recommend trading it. I don't think it will hold. It might hold, but I don't think it would hold. And plus, there's institutional buying right here. Like, look at that. Institutional buying right here. Institutional buying right here. So that's even more pressure to break this zone. Everybody with me on that? We do have a YouTube channel. I've been told I should upload these TikToks to YouTube. If you want our YouTube channel, it's right here. Uh, how do I go out of it? I guess I go home. No, I don't go home. YouTube.com slash Trade Phantoms. There you go. That's our YouTube channel. We don't have a lot of subscribers on YouTube. Um, so, yeah, if you guys want to give us a follow over there, we appreciate it. Um, but, yeah, we share, like, educational content and stuff. But I, I think I should. I'll try and upload one of these uh, TikToks on there and see if people like it. I don't know if they'll enjoy it or if they'll find it boring, right? In which stage were you stopped using people's signals? Never use people's signals, man. Taught from the get-go that that's a stupid way to trade. Now, if someone I know and t trust tells me to go and look at something, will I look at it? Absolutely, I'm happy to look at any edge you give me. But I always have to evaluate if it fits within my risk word ratio parameters and my position sizing, right? And that is something that is different for everyone. Unfortunately, that's the reality of life, right? So here we are um, on my weeklies. What strategy do you use in crypto most time? Doesn't change, Roderick. I'm always looking at institutional order flow price action analysis. What's the most valuable thing you learned since your trading journey? Discipline. Discipline is the most valuable thing I've learned. And I'm still not perfect, guys. I still make emotional mistakes from time to time, but it's rare that I make that type of mistake trading nowadays. But, um, you know, I'm still a human being. <laughs> I can still make mistakes and still get a little more enthusiastic than I should on certain things. Um, uh, I'm not liking this so far. Let's drill down to the daily, see if we have anything actionable. But, I mean, I'm not trading the supplies on the way it's structured. I'm certainly not trading. Look at that. Ugh, it looks super beat up. There is that little, well, let's retest. I was going to say there's that little structure up there, but it doesn't matter because it's already retested. Do you see this? We have this little rally-based drop, but if you look to the left, this is a retest of this rally-based drop. So even then, I wouldn't trade that zone again. There's nothing really good for me here, my man. I mean, uh, down here, this zone's already been hit once, popped back up, right? That was the amounts, rally-based rally, amount rally. supporters pushing price action upwards. Price hit the supply zone, got pushed all the way down, even wicked through, but it didn't break the zone, right, guys? Hit those unfilled buy orders and boom, right back up all the way to supply. And then it bounced out again and so on and so forth. So everything's pretty beat up. There's this little demand zone down here, drop base rally, right? But again, this, this right here to me, guys, this is daily, weekly, monthly correlation, right? And we love zones on top of zones. But when I get this close to price, Look at how close that got. And then it shoots up explosively. I can't ignore it. I can't say like, ah, it didn't hit. It's like, no, it hit. That's 90.25. What's this entry right here? 90.17. You're talking eight pips, guys. Eight one hundredths of a penny. That's how close that got to hit, hitting that zone. Eight one hundredths of a penny. Does that make sense? That's how small that is, that, egg, that entry. Not even a penny. So, well, obviously not a penny. That would be 100 pips. Anyway, you get the point. This is way too close. That, to me, is a hit. It's already bounced off. I'm not going to trade that demand zone again. Our supply zone super beat up. This supply zone's beat up. Best level is up here. But I think if I go and I look to the left, I think this is a retest of previous structure, if I'm not mistaken. Let's go look over here to the left to make sure. But I think, yeah, and we already retested right there. Drop, base, drop. That's a retest of that. Does that make sense? So I wouldn't trade this level either. No, there's nothing I would trade here, man. Now you got to sit in your hands a little bit. You got to wait. Um, because I trade professionally, my man. I've been doing this for a long time. 
If you want to learn more about how we identify zone structure guys, just go to our workshop. Next workshop's next Wednesday. It's free. And we'll teach you more about how professionals trade. You can register for free on our website. Yeah, man. I mean, it's not to say it couldn't work out for you, Fly, but it's super beat up. I wouldn't trade it, right? It's just a low probability trade. And really this, if I look at this zone right here, even if I take this higher zone above, look at how many times it's actually hit. All right, that was where the amounts was created. Price came back in, hit those unfilled orders, pop back out. Came back in, hit those unfilled orders, pop back out. So now we're back for a third time and it's hit already. I don't know if you can see it. It's actually already hit it. Look at that, it already wicked in and popped back out. It's not a significant pop out, but it did already pop back out. That's just too many hits, man. I'm not trading that. That front zone super beat up. One, two, three hits. No, nah, I'm done with that zone. That zone's dead to me. Awesome, man, I'll see you next week. All right, guys, I'll do one more and then I'm gonna head out. It's getting late. I'm getting sleepy, and I have to actually teach a class tomorrow morning. GRTS, let's go look at GRTS, Mitron. You asked me to look at that. GRTS. What is GERTS? Gritstone Bio. It's always surprising when I, like, I've never even heard of them. And you got to think, I used to do pharma, guys. So I don't know how, maybe this company's not that old, but. When was it founded? Oh yeah, that's way after I <laughs> that's way after I left. So never mind. Twenty fifteen. All right. Well, good. That makes me feel better. It's not just me getting senile or something in my forties. All right. Do I have any clear institutional order flow here on the monthlies for Gritstone Bio? Interesting name, huh? Let's. Oh, uh oh, man. I don't think I'm going to be able to tell you a lot on this. So here's the deal, man. If a chart is at all-time highs or all-time lows, I will never trade it, and I will explain why. The nature of how I trade is not me trying to predict what the market's going to do, right? I don't try and predict, oh, I think this is going to happen because this is my thought process. That's not how I trade. The way we trade is we identify areas where banks and institutions are buying and where banks and institutions are selling so we can see if we can buy or sell together with them. If I'm at all time lows, that means I don't have any areas of institutional demand down here, which means if I'm evaluating a trade opportunity here on Gridstone, I wouldn't be able to calculate a profit target. And if I can't calculate a profit target, that means I can't calculate my risk reward ratio and I can't determine if the trade is worth taking or not. So basically what this means is I wouldn't trade this. I wouldn't trade this because I can't properly analyze the charts. Does that make sense? Same thing with all time highs, guys. I would never want to buy at all-time highs. I would never want to short at all-time lows. And I'm not going to try and predict where the market's going to pivot because I don't control that. Who controls that, guys? The banks do, right? If this was going to pivot, all you would need is some big banker institution to buy a major position. That would cause price action to pop up. But for you and me, I don't know where they're going to do that or if they're going to do that. Maybe they're interested in Gridstone. Maybe they think Gridstone is garbage. That I can't tell you. I wouldn't have wasted so much time on uh, technical analysis indicators, stuff like that, Jeremy. I spent months and months try trading all that garbage. So I, I wouldn't do that again. That was a huge waste of my time because it's like anytime you learn a new technical analysis strategy, it's not like you can test it once and you're done. You have to test it for several weeks to see if it works or not, right? So it's just like you waste so much time with all this stuff that no professionals use. Or, well, that actually, let me rephrase that professionals won't use to make their trading decisions. We'll use technical analysis every day. We just don't make our trading decisions off of it. All right. That's it for me, guys. No, I'm done for the night, guys. Thank you so much. For those of you interested in the workshop, next workshop is next Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern. It's going to be with Mr. Green himself. If you'd like to register, just go to our website, tradephantoms.com, and you can register for free by clicking the purple register here button. And in that workshop, we'll do a deeper dive on all this stuff, guys. We'll talk about how the markets really work, how we're identifying where bank institutions are buying and selling so we can buy and sell together with them, how to trade in all directions, how to use leverage properties so you can reduce your capital, reduce your risk, and generate higher rates of return, the difference between all the different asset classes, stocks, options, futures, forex, crypto, and what they're best suited for, 
and training for income versus wealth management. So you'll learn a lot more about how the markets work and how professionals actually trade and analyze in the market. And for those of you interested in becoming Phantoms members, we also offer an opportunity for you to join at a discounted rate. All right? I don't know, man. I was never a math major. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you for all the likes and all the follows, guys. We really do appreciate it. And that is it for me. This is Mr. Black signing off. Take care, everybody.